Arkling Society members, it is I, your trusty virtual professor, Mark Ritson, and I'm honoured to deliver this year's Ogilvy Lecture to the Marketing Society uh, uh, members from Scotland and everyone else uh, who's joining in this afternoon for this session. I'm delighted you're joining me, and I'd like to tell you a little bit of a long-winded introduction as to what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let's go. Uh, I want to start with a pop quiz. I want to make sure you're paying attention. You ready? You should have by now read some version of the original or some pressy of the long and the short of it by the great Binet and Field. Uh, sometimes referred to as Field and Binet, but clearly that's the wrong way around. It has a much better ring to it as Binet and Field. Anyway, they wrote the long and the short of it. And my question to you as we start this Ogilvy lecture is which of those words in the title is the most important? Is it long or is it short? Take a moment. Which of those two is the more important implication, uh, uh, application for marketing professionals like you and me? Ready? The correct answer is neither of them. The most important word in that book of Les and Pete's is the word and. Because it's quite unusual to have a marketing title, as we'll see as we go through this session, that includes that idea of multiplicity, both sides of the coin, inclusivity. Uh, as you'll see, um, it's really a rather lovely thing. And and is indeed the most important word in that book. Uh, and this thought came back to me about a month ago when I read a very, very good post by an advertising planner, I hope he doesn't mind me calling him that, called Tom Roach. Tom's quite famous and, and very experienced and has been around the traps. And Tom wrote this really rather wonderful uh, LinkedIn post called The Wrong and the Short of It. And, and, you know, in all deference to Tom, there's nothing new in it, but it really was purely and beautifully written. Um, and I was very impressed with it. Um, and, and what Tom basically says, and I would encourage you to read it for yourself, is that obviously short termism um, is a bad thing because we know it leads to suboptimal outcomes, um, even though ROI points us in that direction. But he also pointed out that long termism is also a bad thing too, and you can go too much the other way. And he went further and said, look, Field and Burnett, and particularly Burnett, who Tom knows very well and works with, are not merchants of the long any more than they're merchants of the short. At the moment, there is a bias towards short-termism, so the two godfathers of effectiveness tend to push the long boat further. But that's not because they're into long-term stuff. It's that they like to do both, and they feel there is an imbalance in the force. And what Tom keeps saying in this really rather lovely article, in a nutshell, is that we need to balance both approaches. Now, that sounds bloody obvious, but it's not obvious. It can't be obvious, because most companies are skewed one way or the other, almost to the exclusion of the alternative. And everything Tom says really centers on, a, on a, again, a rather splendid chart where he looks at the two different approaches. If you work for a company, and the chances are you probably do, that's overtly short-term in focus, then you suffer from a rather restricted bit of tofu. Yeah, Your top of funnel has too little demand feeding the bottom of funnel where there's splendid performance marketing, wonderful conversion, amazing success. But because your top of funnel is weak, your bottom of funnel is only converting off a certain weaker base. And of course, the flip is true. If you work for a smaller but still equally stupid proportion of companies that are too long term in their approach, well, you've got an amazing bit of tofu up the top. Yeah, you focus on those awareness consideration stages. But when it comes to converting your website, shit, you don't spend enough money probably on digital marketing. And generally, the performance of your conversion is shit house. And the irony of all this is, of course, that if you go too short or too long, the ultimate financial outcome from different paths is equally disappointing either limited long-term growth or limited short-term sales. Either way, to use the economic term, you're going to be fucked eventually. And of course, the point that Tom concludes with is what we want to do is balance out long and short. 
tofu and bofu. Now, not necessarily, as we'll see later, 50-50 or even 60-40. That, that's a naive and simplistic approach. But the point is to acknowledge both sides. And then to go further, to blend them together in the appropriate mix to be a better marketer and work for a more successful brand. Now, what's interesting about this is it made me think. So let me give you my explanation for why most companies are still very short term. And then I'm going to flick to Tom's, OK, because Tom's might be better. So as you probably know, we've had the long and the short of it for a decade as a theory, but most companies aren't just ignoring it. They're continuing to be increasingly focused on short termism. Why is that? Here's my explanation from what I've seen firsthand. I mean, just pull this out of the air. This is what I've seen in organizations I've worked for and with. Now, you're familiar with the Burnett and Field model, um, uh, Field and Burnett. Uh, sales uplift over based on the y-axis, on the x-axis, the period of time that two, three years might be, uh, might be appropriate. Now, as you know, there are two uh, different um, uh, lines of growth. There's a short-term performance marketing line. We put our foot on the pedal. Mm -hmm and sales go up. Woo! The minute we take our foot off the pedal, mm, up, the sales go whoop, back down to where they were before. Not a bad thing because the amount of money and effort on the pedal mm, is more than offset by the return in sales ah, that we're getting. The alternative curve, the blue curve of brand building in, 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 in uh, contrast, is a more incremental and slower but ultimately um, equally rewarding trajectory. And uh, as we know, this isn't the story of long versus short, it's the story of them together producing the short-term results to fill the long-term impact, which feeds the short-term results, and that lovely wheel begins to turn and a brand begins to grow. So how come a theory so simple and so empirically now supported is still largely ignored by most organizations where we look at how and where they're spending their marketing dollars. And the answer, in my opinion, comes down to a simple observation. And the observation is, this is great when you have some kind of eternal time principle on the x-axis. But every company you, I, and everyone else we know has ever worked for lives here in this 12-month planning cycle box. We think in 12-month financial cycles. We all do at the end of the day. Yeah. Now, when you glimpse those famous two lines within that cage of 12 months, look at what we see. Brand building looks, frankly, like a suboptimal approach. And performance marketing, sales activation, conversion, whatever you want to call it, is delivering uh, the money big time maybe with a, a better ROI that's twice that of brand building, three times that of brand building. Only a mug would spend money on the blue stuff when I can get me the red stuff with a much better ROI. Now, as you know, if you're pretty good at marketing, ROI is only half a measure. It's good for the short. It sends you in exactly the wrong direction for the long, and that's why it's kind of a shitty metric. Don't tell everyone because some people are still in love with it. And the point is what happens is Groundhog Day. Every year we go, well, mm, I'm going to get more money from, from investing in short-term performance marketing, so that's what I'll do this year. Next year you go, well, I'm going to get more from that, and that's what we'll do, and that's what we'll do, and that's what we'll do. So my expla explanation for why we've been dramatically shorter than we should have been in recent years is because of the, uh, the budgetary pressures of a 12-month cycle. Now, Tom takes a completely different point of view. What Tom says in his Wrong and Short of It article is, First of all, explaining what we've all known, long-term growth always has its roots in the short term. The two are connected, influence each other. And if you get the two working perfectly in harmony, you'll achieve the strongest, most sustainable growth possible. Amen to that. So why isn't it happening? According to Tom, but we so often miss out on maximizing growth in this way because of our binary belief systems. The organization silos we inhabit, the different job titles we have, the different channels and formats we tend to use, and the different metrics we try to optimize. For Roach, the reason why short is favored over long is tribal. It's cultural. It's sociological. People see the world one way or another. It's not as rational as my explanation, and probably as a result, 
more accurate. So anyway, I thought this was a pretty good post and I um, uh, attempted to pass it on, off as my own work as I like to with all brilliant work with a very tight sentence saying how brilliant it was, hoping people would then read it on my LinkedIn feed, assuming that I had actually written it. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of this work. And sure enough, um, thousands of people read it and commented on it, uh, hopefully some of them believing it was written by me rather than Tom. Uh, people said all kinds of brilliant things about it, as you can see here. But it was Dave Thomas's comment, which came in about a week later than when I made the original post, that really struck me, if anything, as even more interesting than Tom Roach's original column. Dave Thomas said, and I quote in, a, in his LinkedIn post, technically, this will become known as the development of the bothism model led by the brand is the protein and the sales is the workout thinking. Now, as a relatively fat man who's never been anywhere near a gym, except once when I had to meet a girl and then go for a massive Italian meal, I don't really know what that reference at the end is to protein sales and all that shit. But I really liked that one thing that he put in there, bothism. Hmm. Hmm, I thought. Is bothism a thing? And it turns out it's not a thing. It doesn't really exist. David Thomas had invented it. So I thought, as you now know, well, I'll steal that without telling Dave Thomas and I'll start using it in my various different interactions. Like, oh, no, that marketing society talk I've got to give in a month's time. So behold, Dave Thomas and the rest of the marketing society. Here is your David Ogilvy lecture. And it's titled, what do you know? Marketism, marketism, marketing bothism, marketing bothism. So, what do I mean by marketing bothism? Well, first we have to define bothism, which doesn't actually exist. So, I'm going to make it up because I'm allowed to. Bothism is a noun, I think, and the definition I have created is the rare capacity to not only see the value of both sides of the story, but actively consider and then co-opt them into any subsequent marketing endeavor in an appropriate mix. There's a lot going on there, but I figure if I'm going to invent something, albeit something I've pretty much stolen, I get to have a few words to create it. Now, note the antonyms there, because they're far more familiar to marketers. Speciality, isolation, silos, either, or, exclusion. Bothism is the opposite of that, as you can see from the definition. And I want to explore it in this particular Ogilvy talk. So let me give you an example of how this plays out on a simple level, right? Ever since marketing has begun, or at least since I've known about marketing, which is getting to be a very long time now, we've had this eternal discussion between quantitative research, and you all know this, the power of conjoin or whatever the hell else, recently bolstered by machine learning, artificial intelligence, but the power of quantitative numbers and the fact that it, they're far more powerful than the weak, frail, relatively artistic and unreliable qualitative research. If you ever spend time in a business school, you'll discover that almost everyone doing an MBA thinks that quant is it and, and anything else is not to be uh, even contemplated. It's scientific. But then we have the other side of the coin, which is, of course, the more touchy, feely, meaning based idea of qualitative research. Shut up! Sorry. Qualitative research. The deep insights of qualitative. It's inductive. It's ideographic. And of course, we have then the weakness of quantitative, much espoused by qualitative researchers, which is, you know, the observer cannot be separated from the object and therefore we must do qualitative and engage and so forth. You can play this debate out forever. And in reality, if we take the view of marketing bothism, we'd see there is a way out of this jungle. Uh, and by the way, we can continue this all day long talking about ethnography versus focus groups or conjoint versus online research. You can do it within each method as well. So let's remind ourselves the weakness of qual is very simple. It can never be representative data. Therefore, there can never be any sense of what the small group in qual will transpose to the overall market. Therefore, we cannot have any form of representation. Therefore, we cannot have any quantification. Nine people out of nine in a focus group can say they like the thing. 
it will not transpose onto the total population. That in itself means we can't do magnitudes or causality or any of the other cool shit that quantitative people like to do. Qual is indeed fluffy. But before this turns into a big up qual session, let's flip it around. What is the weakness of quant? This is less talked about, but equally limiting. The weakness of quant is if you measure the wrong shit quantitatively, you're equally fucked as just doing qualitative and then trying somehow to add the numbers to it. Let me explain with the stupid example I use on my mini MBA. I say to my students, next week, you have a choice of how I deliver the online lectures. Option A, I can deliver it in swimwear. And this is exactly how it looks. Or option B, I can deliver next week's class stark, bollock, naked. Choose A or B. And I give them a little questionnaire. Sure enough, perhaps no surprise, every fucker in the class votes for A, speedos. Yeah, And I kick off the session. Halfway through the session, the head of marketing week rings me up and says, Mark, it's inappropriate, particularly with your body, to be teaching the mini MBA this week in swimwear. Put some clothes on, man. And I say to Russell, hey, chill out, Russell. I asked all of the students on my mini MBA program last week, what would they like me to do? 100% of them said, we want you in Speedos, Ritson, get it off. And I'm only giving the market, therefore, what they want. You see my point. It's a stupid, silly example, but it illustrates a key challenge that quant on its own is invariably, but often invisibly flawed because we know that A, B and C measure accordingly. But if we didn't include X, Y and Z in our measurements, then all of our numbers are actually off. What does that teach you? It teaches you that research should be approached with bothism, that actually qual and quant in the appropriate levels together are always the right answer. And if you only take one over the other, you are effectively doing the wrong thing. Let's take another example from marketing, a classic one, strategy versus creative. You've all encountered the creative uber ales philosophy in marketing and advertising. Some old guy who's earned a bazillion dollars sits at the top of a building with his name on it and says, listen, creativity is the ultimate advantage. You'll never be able to survive without creativity. The consulting firms won't manage it because they're not creative enough. You need creativity to be successful. It's the ace of spades in the poker game of marketing. And to some degree, that's partly true. But then you get the other side, which has been growing recently. It kind of blows my mind. In my lifetime working on brands, it, it, originally nobody said they were a strategist or a brand strategist. I, I, I don't know what the fuck that means. Yeah, you, you can do brand strategy. Sure, if you're an account planner or a brand manager or just a marketer. But since when did it become some kind of title? And also, it's interesting. Everyone's now talking about strategy is this or that. You know, strategy is storytelling. What the fuck does that mean? Anyway, I digress. The point is, you got strategy and you got creative. Now, can I just interject for one second and explain what strategy is? I couldn't resist. It's kind of off topic, but I'm going to do it anyway. When we do strategy in marketing, at least, we just need to answer the key questions. All that ass about strategy is colors and uh, walking through the park and having beautiful, all that nonsense. It's really not that hard, right? Pretend you're a plumber, right? Instead of a philosopher. So all marketing strategy or brand strategy is, is first of all, working on who we're going to target, then working out what the positioning is then setting up some pretty decent objectives to drive our activity and a little bit of brand architecture, I find, just to work and make sure we're applying the right brands to the right questions. But that's kind of what it is. All the rest of it is just kind of a lot of wank that surrounds the topic. Anyway, I digress. The point of this slide is to say there is a growing uh, tension between these two areas. I'll give you an example. And I apologize here. I'm quoting someone called Dong Draper. I'm pretty sure he's not called Dong Draper, but he might be, and my apologies if he is. Anyway, Dong Draper recently tweeted, why do strategists think that being a strategist is a, personally, is a personality trait? Laugh my ass off. Almost immediately, someone from the strategy community who found that offensive tweeted back, Michael Cates, why do creatives think they're the only ones who, who get to have ideas? Now, you see what's going on here. It's a classic, simple example 
of a, uh, you know, uh, an eye for eye, uh, half a coin each approach. And, and it's ludicrous, right? It's ludicrous because literally strategy needs creative and creative needs strategy. And if you don't believe me, just study your basic marketing uh, history. The point of a creative brief is to be the bridge between the final strategic decisions and the creative execution that follows. They literally have to be part of the bothist philosophy because they're connected right in the bloody middle. So you see my point again. So when I say bothism, and I'm really going to try and make this catch, right? I'm really having a go at this with you guys from the Marketing Society because I think we should try this. Anyway, when I say bothism, what I first mean is we need to hunt down and remove the tyranny of the awe. Now, that isn't something that I invented. It actually was invented by Jim Collins, who wrote Built to Last. It's not a bad airport book. And Jim Collins turns out to be that rare thing, a guru who's actually pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, here's the Jim Collins quote that I read when I started to hunt down this idea of bothism, because he's definitely got it worked out on a broader corporate strategy level. Collins says in his introduction to Built to Last, you'll notice throughout the rest of this book, that we use the yin-yang symbol from Chinese dualistic philosophy. We've consciously selected this symbol to represent a key aspect of highly visionary companies. They do not oppress themselves with what we call the tyranny of the awe, the rational view that cannot easily accept paradox, that cannot live with two seemingly contradictory forces or ideas at the same time. The tyranny of the awe pushes people to believe that things must be either A or B, but not both. This is what I'm talking about. We do this in marketing all the time. And I think we should stop because Jim seems a pretty smart guy. And this seems like a load of bullshit to me. Let me go further. So let's take the classic example of stupid, fucked up binary thinking. Okay. For the last 15 years, we've been arsing on about digital communications, digital advertising, and digital marketing, yeah? And we had to create something that wasn't digital, so we invented traditional communications, traditional advertising, traditional marketing. And a whole host of bearded and non-bearded sockless wonders have gone off explaining why this is better than that. And a few old paunchy people have said, well, actually, this is actually sometimes better than that. We're all missing the point completely. Bothism shows us the way. And, and by the way, I'm not inventing false dialogue here. This is all recent stuff. Look, social media versus traditional media. Make the transition to digital marketing, right? As if they're two completely different things. Or even better this week, Online media versus traditional media. Who's the king now, motherfuckers? Yeah. Again, it's it's just ludicrous, superficial, two-dimensional thinking. And made all the more stupid by the fact that right now we sit on this period where so-called traditional and so-called digital are about 50% each. So there are three problems with this ridiculous binary approach to comms. First of all, let me illustrate again with a second pop quiz. Which of these three formerly traditional media are now more digital? Is it A, newspapers? Is it B, radio? Or is it C, outdoor advertising? Which of those three would you regard as the least traditional and most digital now? The answer? It's all of them. All of these media now derive far more than 50% of their audience and or revenues from digital communications. Any newspaper still in business making money is making far much more money and getting far more eyeballs from its online digital presence than things printed on paper. We long ago, more than 18 months ago, passed the point in the United Kingdom where, where radio was listened to more on a broadcast platform than via a digital platform. It's now a digital medium. And outdoor has been revolutionized by, uh, by digital uh, screens. There's very little paper around in Edinburgh or Glasgow anymore. It's all digital. So it kind of means that the term digital communications is pointless. The only pure play traditional media I can think of is that weird loony bloke that walks around the old town in Edinburgh with that sign saying the end is nigh. He may not be there anymore, but last time I was in Edinburgh, he definitely was. He's traditional. Everything else now is definitely a blend. 
The second reason why this is a nonsensical binary divide is consumers don't care. Digital, traditional. Try explaining to a 17-year-old how they're mixing together the traditional and digital worlds that they inhabit while looking at their phone and watching TV. It's just something the industry invented. No one else has a problem with these two silos. But finally, and the most important point, is we miss, when we do this binary separation, the wonderful synergies that can be had from mixing and matching different media, especially from the traditional and digital world. I'll give you a good example this week. So I don't know Kevin Gibbons. I'm sure he's a fantastic person. In fact, I know he must be a fantastic person because he was UK Search Personality of the Year 2018. Wowzers. Anyway, Kevin posted something on LinkedIn that said, a quiz, which activity do you find moves the needle the most on organic search performance? Is it technical SEO, on-site content, or digital PR? Not PR, digital PR. And people voted. And then I saw this and thought, hello, this smacks of hypocrisy to me. And so I posted a helpful comment. And my comment, first of all, introducing myself as traditional marketer of the year 1992, was what a shame mass media wasn't option number four. Because I know, and I suspect Kevin knows, that the best way to move the needle on organic search isn't any of those three stupid options. It's to take out a TV ad or outdoor or, God forbid, radio. So I voted for number four, mass media, and 323 people agreed with me. Now, my point again is that's a bothist approach, is it not? And that above is the opposite. So communications, we must take a bothist approach. And it wouldn't be a decent presentation without a nice database uh, slice from the wonderful company Analytic Partners, who recently, 2020, looked into the synergies that take place when you combine two media together. Now, if we take, for example, all of those nice media over there and we add something else, usually from the other side of the digital traditional spectrum, look what happens to the overall effectiveness of the different media when we take a bothist approach. For example, if you take an out-of-home campaign, put a little money into search, you get a 5% bonus on performance. Not from extra money, but from just spreading a little bit of the existing money across to a different tool. Even better, if you take that out-of-home money and slide a little bit onto online video, you get an almost 20% return. Oh, sorry, back. And best of all, look at TV and online video. What does that tell you about bothism? For 10 years, we've been having an argument with ourselves about YouTube, ooh, ITV, YouTube, ITV. Guess what the answer was? Do them both at the same time and split your budget. Look what you get, a 35% incremental synergy by taking the bothist approach. Why do we keep not getting this message? Look at the synergies that happen when you mix tools together. Bothism works. Diversity works. Inclusivism works. Let's do it more. So communications, another example of bothism uh, uh, benefiting marketing. Let's take positioning, right? You know the story here. We spent about 50 years banging on about differentiation. First, Ross Reeves talked about the USP, the unique selling proposition. It was a total load of balls. There's no such thing as a unique proposition that no one else can't eventually claim. But Ross didn't care because it was 1962. He was smoking a lot of cigarettes. And frankly, no one was really paying attention. Then we got to the 70s and Jack Trout wrote, differentiate or die. The opposite of both is die. You're going to die if you don't differentiate, right? The, the ultimate anti-bothist approach. And more recently, we've, we've had Simon Sinek just making lots of shit up with circles about how people really look carefully at companies and assess them based on how they... Bleh, absolute horseshit. Anyway, meanwhile, we've now swung across to the other end of the street. Our colleagues from Ehrenberg Bass da, 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 have made a very important and empirical input into the process by pointing out that differentiation has been wildly overstated. And the real key, the real answer to positioning your brand for success is distinctiveness. It doesn't mean the same thing as differentiation. It's a far more uh, low-key, realistic uh, objective. And uh, Let me be clear. Um, Ehrenberg Bass have done a good thing here, right? To take us away from this bullshit and swing the needle that way is good. 
But note they have swung the needle completely the other way. And, and to be fair again to them, most of their work is taken to extremes by others who don't really fully understand what they're saying. But nonetheless, we, you can feel this pendulum swing from differentiate or die. No, 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 no. Distinctiveness. Different. So many conferences in the last year, someone's got up and said, there's no such thing as differentiation. All brands are perceived to be the same. Sure they are. Again, Bofism would triumph for us here. Why make a false choice? I agree Aaron Bobas are correct in the sense that distinctiveness has been overlooked and is inarguably more important in most cases than differentiation. But it doesn't mean we can't have both. And if you work on a decent brand, and I know a few good brand managers and CMOs, what you've got is a very tight explanation of your DNA, your purpose, your values, whatever you want to call it. That's the intended differentiation, yeah? And then you've got, because you know what you're doing, a equally tight list of codes or distinctive assets or whatever you want to call them, which are the way in which you achieve distinctiveness. Here's the key point. You need to have both of these in place, but you need to have them on a single page. And if you don't, and trust me, I know a lot of billion dollar brands that do, you've gone too far. You don't need seven words over here or three words over here for different concepts. You need a handful of words that describe what you want to be differentiated on and you won't own it, but you could relatively be it. And then equally, if not more important, the set of distinctive assets or codes that you will mercilessly apply in order to stand out in the marketplace. But the point is have both. It's a false choice. And while we're at it, we've got to go after Professor Sharp again. He is the most important and influential thinker in marketing. And that means he's also got a lot of other anti bofist ideas. Mass marketing. Let's go after that one, right? He said recently, textbooks have condemned mass marketing to a premature grave. Rather than trying to hem their brands into niches, good marketers are always looking for broad reach. You know this. One of the biggest impacts of Ehrenberg Bass has been, and it is a remarkable tale, to turn around the perspective of the marketing community globally that mass marketing is bad and persuade them that actually, within a few parameters of sophisticated mass marketing, it actually makes more sense. Now, when Sharp does this, he runs directly against the traditional marketing corpus. And this hombre over here, Theodore Ted Levitt, probably the greatest thinker in the history of marketing. And look at that hair, right? The point I would make to you is, that when, when Theodore Levitt said, if you're not thinking segments, you're not thinking, he set in place a 50-year revolution that said STP. Along comes Sharp, who says, mm, not so fast. Actually, mass marketing isn't so dumb. This is one of the great moments in the history of marketing, and it only happened relatively recently. Now, you know probably that I have a dog in this hunt. About three years ago, I had a big debate, that's me over there, with Professor Sharp on this very topic. Professor Sharp made the case for mass marketing. I made the case for targeting. It was a big event at the Festival of Marketing in London. Now, um, I don't want to talk about the results or the outcome of that vote. That's not important. And we are in a, a session that's talking about bofism. So I don't want to go, oh, where did that come from? Look at that. Anyway, I don't want to go on about that that triumph. I mean, it is a massive smashing. Um, what I want to talk about is that, oh, I don't know what's going on here with this keyboard. But what I want to talk about, oh, look at the size of that thing. 59% 59, 59 went with me. That's a dramatic, anyway, you get the point. The point is you can play either case. And this is meant to be a bovism talk, not a debate about who's right and who's wrong. It's some kind of gladiatorial contest. Last year, however, the Effies invited me to look at all of their uh, thousands, as you can see over there, of submissions for Effies over the last 50 years and see if I could draw some empirical patterns, um, albeit in a loose way, from the data. Well, one of the things I was most interested in was finding out if my rhetoric, which had won the day in the conference, was actually true. I was able to split up all the campaigns that overtly went after target segments, which is what I was fighting for, or went with sophisticated mass marketing in the category, which is what Professor Sharp argues for, and just look at which ones had the most effectiveness when we gave each a score for its overall impact on the market. Well, when we looked at the target segment campaigns, they averaged a score of 0.35. It's pretty good compared to the overall total set. And then when we looked at the mass marketing approaches, we discovered that they only got 0.45. Fuck, as we stay in statistics, Professor Sharp was correct. 
and he is right, by the way, and he deserves kudos because he's reversed that whole perspective of mass marketing being bad and proven his case innumerable times. But look over there. That isn't chopped liver. Target segmentation also seems to deliver some effectiveness too. So what's going on? What's going on is we should take a bothist approach to targeting. If you go back and look at short-term performance marketing using the work of, of Field and Burnett, what you discover from their IPA data is that when we look at short-term activation effects, big ones, the best impact you're going to get is still from that back black bar of targeting existing customer segments. Segmentation and targeting still plays here. But the big revolution is when you go for brand building, when you go for big long-term brand building stuff, Professor Sharp is exactly right. And the biggest annual market share growths that Binet and Field observe come from targeting both existing segments and new segments, essentially the whole of the category. So it's possible to, to take both perspectives here. Uh, and when I work with companies more and more, I try and propose a two-speed brand planning approach. What I mean by that is we do our diagnosis and our segmentation as a single unitary thing, because it's about the market. But then I, I propose that they split their marketing planning at that point into two different budgets and two different approaches, long and short. The long is mass marketed. It's about everyone in the category. It's about delivering on a clear brand position and obviously codes. It has brand building objectives measured through brand tracking and the appropriate tactics, which tend to be obviously more emotional, more mass, slightly not completely swayed away from digital. But then, aha, we also have the other split, which is devoted to target segmentation, short-term 12-month activation. Here we're going to position products with very tight objectives and the appropriate tactics, more digital, more product-based, more activation-oriented to deliver that growth. Long and short, mass and targeted, bothism before your eyes. And the key point, there may be many target segments in a particular marketing year. So, again, a two-speed brand plan and the idea of targeting. Now, let's go further, because Jim Collins is even better than I've already said to you, because he doesn't just talk about the tyranny of the ore, he also talks about the genius of the end, and that is what I want from this session. Collins says, instead of being oppressed by the tyranny of the ore, highly visionary companies, why not marketers, liberate themselves and the genius with the genius of the and, the ability to embrace both extremes of a number of dimensions at the same time. Instead of choosing between A or B, they figure out a way to have both A and B. The genius of the and. Now, why aren't we doing this? Well, we see ourselves in marketing as fundamentally inclusive diverse people. We welcome diversity. We make ads about diversity. We encourage inclusivity. We do all that to some degree with our work and even with our offices. But when it comes to our ideas, we don't do any of that shit. When it comes to our thinking and our models and our theory development, we are the Kim Jong-il of, of theory development. There can only be one answer and it's better than the other shit answer. Why is that? Why are we so tyrannical about ideas? A couple of reasons. First, there are a bunch of agencies who have to sell an approach, a trademark system that's better than the other shit system in order to get ahead. We've been struggling with that for a long time. Marketing science. Look, I'm not a huge fan of marketing science. It's done some good things. Yeah, It's pushed evidence to the fore. That's a great thing. It's made us more rigorous over the last 10 years. That's a great thing. But science, at least the Popperian falsificationist view of science, talks about there being ultimately only one tentatively held answer until we can disprove it and replace it with another. This is not bothism. This is the opposite of bothism. And marketing scientists contributed to, that's wrong, this is right, put your test tubes out there, let's work out the answer. Social media has also become, over the last five to ten years, a giant pissing contest in which I'm going to show you that I'm right by proving that you're wrong. We all do it. It makes for interesting interactions and 
crucially, lots of follows and notoriety. But it doesn't help the process of bofism. And then we have the pornography of change, something that most marketers are absolutely obsessed with. The pornography of change is built upon this idea that what's happening now and next is better than what happened before. You can't have a bit of the old and a bit of the new. The new has to be better than the old, which was stupid and outdated. Behold new, hate the old. And again, it hurts us from a bofism point of view. And at the heart of all this is the great irony that marketing doesn't have one way, doesn't have one dominant approach, one successful path. It isn't physics. Marketing isn't gravity. The consumer is reflective. Culture moves and shimmers and changes. And because of all those different paths and options, we have many different sticks with which we can beat each other. And maybe a last point, if you look at the lovely work of Reach Solutions over the last 12 months, they've demonstrated very clearly that actually, rather than diversity, most of the people who work in marketing in the UK, as opposed to the, mar the consumers they, uh, they target, come from A, B backgrounds when they were growing up. It's quite a non-diverse group of people. Probably no surprise, therefore, that they kind of all agglomerate together thinking this is the right answer versus that. There isn't enough diversity in our discipline. We talk about it, but we ain't got it. So one last point, which will make the case for why I believe marketing bothism is so important. There's a wonderful little known concept called contronyms. Contronyms are a fascinating lexical construct. They're words, and there's about 75 of them. They're words which actually mean the opposite of themselves within the same word. Let me explain by giving you an example. Quantum. Quantum is either something so enormous you can't envisage it, or so tiny you can't envisage it. Uh, a, a less fancy one. Rent. I could tell you I'm renting my apartment. What does that mean? Does it mean that I'm receiving money from someone, or does it mean I'm paying money to someone? Rent means both things, both directions. Wind up. That can mean to start something up, or it can mean to bring it back down again. Trip, I'm going on one, or I've had one, means either I'm making progress or I've just fallen down. You get the idea. Now, I want to add marketing as the 76th contronym, which makes bofism a particularly important facet. Why is marketing a contronym? Well, think about what we really do when we do our jobs well. On the one hand, we're always in listening mode. Empathetic, learning, market orientation, research, segmentation, which is fundamentally descriptive. This is about respecting and learning and understanding and taking our coordinates from the market. In contrast, we also have that other part of us, that part that wants to change the market. We want to persuade. We want to do stuff. We want to target. We want to position. We want to set objectives for change. We want to communicate. We want to listen and we want to change. We want to respect and we want to alter. Marketing is fundamentally a contronym. Now, the two things are linked together, of course, but don't make the mistake, the oversimplistic mistake of assuming I need to do 50-50. One of the things about marketing bothism, if you look back at my definition, is it's not necessarily about half here and half there. It's in the appropriate amount, and that amount might change from time to time. This is another point that Jim Collins makes as he talks about this idea of the tyranny of all. He says in his book, we're not talking about mere balance here. Balance implies going to the midpoint, 50-50, half and half. A visionary company doesn't seek balance between short and long term, for example. It seeks to do very well in the short and very well in the long. You get the point. There's a more a subtle nuance there. And he goes on to say, in short, a highly visionary company doesn't want to blend yin and yang into grey indistinguishable circle that is neither highly yin nor highly yang. It aims to be distinctly yin and distinctly yang, both at the same time, all of the time. That is the challenge of marketing bothism. Not to have a little bit of that and a little bit of this, but actually to keep them separate and let their dualities play off each other to the appropriate level of success. And that is my challenge to you, Marketing Society member. I'm not going to make this about 2020. 2020 is officially a shithouse write-off, survive, lock yourself in your bedroom year. Nothing amazing or good is going to happen this year other than a massive piss-up on December the 31st. I turn my attention instead to 2021 and the gleaming green pastures of the future. This is the year I believe we should push 
marketing bothism through and towards our discipline. I believe this is the year where we should start to see marketing as a fundamentally bothist pursuit, where we don't tolerate any one approach, but we open ourselves to all the sides of the equation and blending them together, where we in, in, in adapt ourselves to both forms of research, where we open ourselves to mass and targeting, where positioning becomes differentiation and distinctiveness, where short-termism is matched with long-termism in the appropriate balance, where communications is neither traditional or digital, it's just an optimum mix of different tools. This will be my challenge to you for 2021. So let's get into that mode. Let's start to practice through 2020 to prepare ourselves for bothism and 2021. When you want to vote, think about Boris and Kia. When you want to get drunk, think about gin and tonic. When you think about singers, it's both Benny and Bjorn. When you think about bands, it, this is a hard one for me, it's also it's Blur and also Oasis. And when you think about bands, it's Duran and Duran. When you think about organs, it's both the cock and the pussy, the pussy and the cock. When you think about companies, it's Unilever and it's P&G. When you think about teams, it's both Celtic and Rangers. What? I've gone too far. I knew it. I've gone too far with the football clubs. But you get my point. Both together, being themselves differently, but combining together for an amazing and astonishing combined effect. It's about heroes, David and Ogilvy. It's about this lecture on marketing bothism from me, your presenter, Mark Ritson. Thank you.